Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're all safe and well, and thank you for, for joining us for this webinar entitled Office Design and Operations. What could it look like post-COVID? Uh, one positive out of all this is we clearly won't be short of CPD in 2020. Um, I'm Andy Heath, Regional Chair of the BCO. And on the back of the, the BCO briefing note, which was issued uh, a couple of weeks ago, we wanted to have a look at two aspects of, of COVID. The initial resumption to work, what might what may that look like in the, in the short term? And, and then secondly, looking at the longer term implications of how this may change, how the office is used and, and operated uh, going forward. To help us talk through this, we have uh, assembled a talented panel um, of people to help us. So we have Emma Dowden, COO of Burgess Salmon, one of the, the largest occupiers in Bristol to give us the occupiers perspective. Uh, from the architect's angle, we have John Wright, a director at Stride Glown. And then from the m and &E angle, we have Matt Heeman, a partner at Hall Lee. The format is we'll try and keep this to, to 30 minutes. Uh, each panelist will share their thoughts and views for five minutes each, and we'll then move on to a Q&A session. We've had some questions in already, but you'll see at the bottom of your screen, if you click on the Q&A um, box there, you can submit any questions that, uh, that you have or thoughts that you may want to share with everyone. And we'll try and pick up as many of those at the end as we can. Um, so without any further ado, I will pass over to Emma to kick us off. Thank you. Thank you, Andy, and good afternoon to everyone. Can I have the first slide, please? Thank you. I thought it might be helpful by way of setting some context to talk about how we are scenario planning around COVID. Like um, dealing with any crisis, I always think it's important to have a framework. So we've set some context around five different horizons. The first two very immediate um, scenarios around how you adjust to immediate working needs and the financial management and so on. So the two that I want to talk about this afternoon briefly are what we're calling our return phase. So what would any return to the office look like? Not return to work. I think people get that wrong because we're all working remotely. It's so how do we go about reoccupying our office spaces and also the reimagine um, phase as well. So next slide, please. From a return perspective, obviously we've seen sort of unprecedented change. We've emptied out our offices in, in record time. We've all had to adjust to a very new and different way of working. The way that we've been going about our planning is to, to plan for the worst and hope for the best in terms of what a return might look like. But as we know, it's going to look very different. Um, COVID secure, um, bringing with it a number of requirements around social distancing, around how our offices will look and feel. And of course, the safety and well-being and confidence of our people to reoccupy is going to be absolutely paramount and forefront of any thinking. My view is that any return to the office will be on a very slow and measured basis. And of course, the government um, ongoing advice is to work from home if you can. We're a professional services organisation. Um, we can broadly do that. We have a very small team of Reaper Graphics people working from our Bristol headquarters. But beyond that, everyone is, is able to work from home. So what would a reintroduction look like? Well, I think you'd have to think very carefully about occupancy levels. So we're planning on um, an initial very small pilot group and then occupancy maybe up to 25, 30%. But we certainly foresee um, that the model we're in now is significant amount of agile and home working staying with us for some time to come. So I think we've all got to get used to what a new normal might look like. And I see that really the office will become a hub. So it's somewhere that you would attend for a specific purpose um, where you can't do um, what you need to do from home. So I think it's a different mindset that we need to get into. And of course, um, we can't forget that if there's a second spike of the virus or there might be regional lockdowns that we could quite well be going back through this cycle of lockdown and return again. And I think there's lots of specifics that come here that, that I know others are going to get on and talk about, but I think it helps set some context for what an office might be like. If you, I can have the next slide, please. Thank you. And one of the things we've really tried to focus on is what we're calling our reimagination. So what are all the, the great things from um, crisis management that we don't want to lose in future? And what are all the things that we can learn and do differently? And, and like all of you, we're reading a loss in, in the market at the moment, um, straying from will it be a return to normal or actually at the other end of the spectrum, is it the end of the office or actually is it somewhere in between? And I have to say, I advocate the, the latter. I really don't see it as the end of the office. I think we might do things differently, but it's always going to have its place and its purpose. 
Um, I think inevitably we will see people questioning the size of their footprints and looking at consolidation. We've heard a number of people talk about that in the press recently in terms of what space they really need to occupy. And actually a lot of these conversations were happening anyway, but maybe COVID-19 has become the burning platform or the driver for change to really think about how we occupy our workplace. There's a number of benefits from the way that we've been working. We've seen really unprecedented level and, and pace of change. It's really accelerated home working, having to embrace agile working and obviously online um, collaboration as well through all of the tech tools that we're now so familiar with and demonstrating today. So we're going to need to think about how we reincorporate those within any office space as well. I think different facilities will come to the fore. Um, so we know from the government's advice, encouraging everyone to walk, cycle, run to work. So the buildings will need to be able to sustain that change. And obviously the ventilation, the fresh air in the buildings will all go towards that feeling of confidence of people to return and being COVID secure as well. The reason why I think we haven't lost the, the workplace forever is we're all people and we rely on human interactions. We might have an introvert or extrovert preference that suits working from home or not, but ultimately um, the hub, the workplace is where people come together to interact. I think it really goes to the heart of an organization's culture and its collegiality. So I, um, you just can't replicate those things through the technology tools. So I think there'll be absolute ongoing requirement for that. Mm. One of the things that I think is really important is the context of the change management around this. So we, we have, we've been forced to deal with sort of unprecedented change, as I've said, but we're all people. And actually, this has been very much a change management exercise. And I think it's really important to think about that in the context of some of the future transformational change. So, you know, when do we need to be make sure we're being very empathetic to our people? And what are the ways in which we can help guide people through realising those benefits in the future? I think when we come back, we'll see very much an activity based workplace. That's the way that things were shifting in any event, but really questioning the what are the things I need to do? What's the purpose of the office place? And, and finally, for me, before I hand over, what's my prediction for the future? Will I actually see a hybrid model? So as I say, I don't think we'll lose our, we'll always have a HQ within any organisation. But in addition to that now, we'll probably have regional hubs and then I think an ongoing um, high amount of home working. So it will become a model where you go to the office for a purpose to interact with certain people and do certain things. And that will be in combination with um, regional office, local office hubs, and as I say, a huge degree of agile and home working as well. So that's just some headline thoughts from me. Um, thank you for listening. I'm going to hand over to John. Great. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, good, good afternoon, I think it is, to everybody. Um, uh, thanks for joining us. Um, I'm going to be focusing on what Emma has referred to as the reimagination phase. Um, there's plenty of guidance on the immediate return to work and much of it's based on returning to the same spaces. But I want to talk about how post-COVID workplace design needs to concentrate on people. Next, please. We all know that the most valuable offices are occupied by businesses who are part of the knowledge economy and that the most valuable and expensive assets those companies have are the people who work for them. Therefore, even in a post-COVID depression, um, providing an office that helps to attract and retain the best people will still be a key differentiator. Next, please. The release from lockdown is clearly going to accelerate uh, change in how people work. It's change that's already been happening, um, but it's probably going to take a slightly different direction. And therefore, what's needed in the office is also going to change. Next, please. The businesses who previously thought working from home was impossible, either because they didn't have the necessary systems or kit, or they simply didn't trust their people to do it. Um, the genie is now obviously well and truly out of the bottle and we're not going to put it back. Next, please. So any business that survives COVID um, will uh, have learned a lot about their people and how they can work. Many businesses, including my own, are now out there surveying their, their, their colleagues to gain insight into how, how those people would like to work and change their working patterns in the future. And working from home has actually taught us that we really value time with our colleagues, shouldn't take it for granted, just as much as we value time away from them. Next, please. I believe that the general consensus, that, that there is general consensus, that there are real, some real positives that have come from working from home. It's given us quiet time to concentrate, think, get work done, and that's really valuable. Some people 
including me, spend way too much time traveling uh, either to and from work or traveling to meetings. And the virtual meetings can be shorter and more efficient so that we will travel less um, to face to face meetings in the future. Next, please. But when we work from home, there are things that we really miss about the office, those chance encounters that lead to great ideas or finding out about a project that you could contribute to, the opportunity to gather a group of people together with some fat pens and brainstorm a problem or a project, those casual conversations during the working day with colleagues where we learn about families and life outside work, which actually bond people together, and the ability to spot that there's a member of your team who's struggling with a problem and being able to help, providing on the job training to go gu and guidance and of course going to the pub um, in short the community of people built up in any successful business can't be replicated by team meetings and friday drinks done over zoom or any other virtual platform um, and we shouldn't ignore the fact that many people don't actually have a great place to work at home and that others like the separation that going to work provides between work and home life and i think we're all struggling from that at the moment next please our initial thoughts are that post-COVID offices will need to be more bespoke and more flexible. They'll need to respond to a variety of different working patterns, different types of work, and possibly even different weather and times of year. Next, please. Therefore, there'll be less battery desks. I think we all know that. Um, more choice of task-based working uh, settings, flexibility to adapt some spaces and, and furniture, so less fixed heavy furniture maybe. Um, more virtual meeting facilities where we can have a mix of real and virtual people. Uh, more social cafe casual spaces, but also some quiet enclosed nurturing spaces for those introverts. Um, better kit to facilitate working from home over a longer period, better walking, running, cycling facilities, as Emma's talked about, and better people management. Next, please. The post-COVID office will, will definitely have people really at the heart of it, the design of it, offering more choice, more flexibility, facilitate less traveling, be more bespoke to particular occupants, less one size fits all, and please, no gimmicks. Um, next please my final point um, is that i do believe that all of this will accelerate changes and improvements that were already happening in the key areas of sustainability and health and well-being or what will now become health safety and well-being with post with covid secure environments um, so no pretty pictures of offices um, i'm now going to pass over to matt human Good afternoon. Um, first, I'm going to focus on the possible transmission routes through event systems, as this is clearly a concern. The measures to consider or to implement initially, and we may react long term in the design of ventilation systems, and briefly set out other features that we could see included in the future. There are three transmission routes, large droplets from sneezing and coughing, via surface contact and then via hands, and plumes that are caused when toilets are flushed with the lid up. I'll be focusing on the probable airborne transmission route. This is shown in light blue. Small particles created from sneezes, etc., may, and I stress may, stay airborne and remain active for some time in indoor air. There is a debate currently about how long and how far these particles will survive and travel. However, airborne transmission has caused flu infections in the past. So for the coronavirus, it is likely, but not yet documented. Next slide, please. Looking now at these mechanical ventilation systems and what may need to be done to get buildings open again. The areas of the diagram to focus on are the red and the blue arrows. Some air handling systems mix extra air from the occupied space with fresh air to improve energy efficiency. Therefore, virus particles could re-enter. It is therefore recommended to close the recirculation dampers if these are installed. And while this may lead to cooling or heating capacity issues, this may have to be accepted in the short term, as contamination prevention is probably more important than thermal comfort. Consider running ventilation systems for 24-7 or starting well ahead of the first occupants arriving and running on after hours. This increases the air change rate to dilute any particles in the spaces. And if possible, it will be tricky, consider turning off fan coil units to reduce mixing of air. Again, this will lead to comfort issues. If you can't turn them off, consider running them continuously at lower speeds. Next, investigate 
possibly increasing the fresh air rate from your mechanical vent ventilation plant. This is probably unlikely, but one benefit of the reduced occupancy due to social distancing that we'll see is an increase in fresh air per provided per person. Naturally ventilated buildings open windows, again, at the expense of comfort. Try and keep them open all day, but again, you'll need to consider security. And finally, on this slide, probably don't open windows in mechanically ventilated toilets. There's a, there's a chance that by doing so, you can blow air back into the occupied zones. Next slide, please. There's a few other considerations. Um, there are some contrasting views at the moment about the impact of relative humidity on the transmission rate. Some evidence suggests that a relatively low humidity makes people more susceptible to infection. Other studies say not. Combating the virus by changing humidity and temperatures is not an option due to the very high settings that we required. There are also devices known as room air cleaners. Unfortunately, those that are attractively priced are not effective enough. Check that there are no exhaust looms discharging directly adjacent to fresh air intakes. There shouldn't be. But if so, the particles could potentially re-enter the building. Change air filters regularly to maintain full fresh air rates. But duct cleaning shouldn't be required if other measures are being implemented. One thing to think about is that energy costs are likely to be higher for running plant for longer. And the opening windows again will impact upon energy costs. And maintenance will be more expensive as things are running longer and will need to be changed more regularly. Next slide, please. Um, so looking briefly now at how designers may react in the future, most traditional ventilation systems or cooling systems within buildings mix up the air so that the viruses could be distributed around the space. One alternative option might be that we go back to looking at displacement ventilation. As shown in the drawing, the ventilation works by introducing fresh air through the floor void. This effectively provides a personal fresh air supply, even in multi-occupied rooms. It's worth remembering, however, that we cannot design buildings cost effectively that could have been occupied safely throughout the crisis. So the future design reactor is probably more to do with how we entice people back into buildings. Other measures that we might see are that fresh air rates increase permanently. Heat recovery systems will change. We may see more space per occupant and we might start designing in the ability to control humidity. Next slide, please. Think about the number of things that you touch each day in a building. No touch sensors where you wave your hand close to a device will become much more popular. The list of devices that will become no touch will be extensive. Again, these devices wouldn't have made buildings occupiable now, but may help to get people back. Next slide, please. And finally, we're already designing buildings to be more intelligent, and this is going to increase and accelerate. The ability to log occupancy, air quality, whether people are cramming, etc., may become essential to give building occupants the comfort that they need. How we share information, alerts and reminders is also going to change. Your mobile phone is personal to you and is rarely handled by others, so it should be safe. And it's probably going to become how you interact with your workplace and how, interact, how it interacts with you. It could raise alarms when air quality is poor or tell you which lift is empty and therefore which one to get into. The list will go on. That's it from me. Thank you very much. Andy will now deal with the Q&A. Great stuff. Thank you all. That was great stuff. I will tell you, if I stop sharing there, then we should be able to, uh, to see, us, see us all. Um, Matt, we'll stick with you then, starting the, the Q&A session. I mean, Bristol has been fairly vociferous in its ambition to be carbon neutral um, by, by 2030, along with, with other major regional centres. Is that still viable under the, what may change from an m &E perspective going forward, or is that just pie in the sky now? Well, I think it, it has to be. I think there will be potentially a pause. Um, and as I said, uh, there is likely to be an increase in energy usage and carbon emissions from buildings. Uh, however, this isn't sustainable. Um, as I said, we can't design buildings cost effectively that will survive the next pandemic. Um, so you know, we, we can't design buildings that would react to this, to, to have reacted to this situation. And with lower occupancies uh, and the lower gains that we're going to see in spaces, that will probably allow us to design lower energy and therefore lower carbon solutions. Um, 
So reducing greenhouse gases and adapting climate change should be integral to any recovery package. It shouldn't, it shouldn't stall it. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, got John, we'll, we'll go back to something you, you picked up on. And yeah, let's talk about whether a vaccine is, is gonna be produced or, or not, but let's, let's assume that something is produced that gives us all a bit more comfort. Is there not a risk therefore in 12 months time, 18 months time, we just revert to type and go back to where we are today? I think that that's really interesting. We, we've actually, as our sort of um, office reoccupation task force has been working, one of the one of the key things that we're very keen to do is to not let that happen. And obviously, as you reoccupy, most people, I, I suspect very few people, uh, apart from Cushman and Wakefield's Amsterdam office, um, will have been able to refit during the, the lockdown. So at, at best, people may have taken away furniture, but we all know, you know, office furniture is very heavy. You require lots of people to, to move it around and IT and all that. So I'm suspecting most of us, when we reoccupy, we'll just go back into exactly the same spaces, but some of the chairs removed and, and signs on desks saying don't sit here and things like that. Um, so I don't think we will be able to. I, I suspect you know, the government seems to be taking quite a cautious approach to reoccupying offices because most people can continue to work from home and therefore I think we'll be at quite low densities for a long time. So some of the attraction of the office of going and being with everybody in that kind of um, environment where everybody's sort of feeding off each other that's actually not going to be there so it's even more likely people will want to stay at home so it's it's probably going to be a matter of attracting them back with what I was talking about the sort of better facilities for collaboration so that you can go and meet with your colleagues you can go and um, have those brainstorming sessions or just team meetings catch-ups or even just to be sociable because um, I suspect most of us are uh, missing our colleagues now um, the, the, the small groups that we're in um, so I, I, I think there is a danger and I think that's the easiest thing for, for management and, and designers to just say oh it's fine you just carry on we just, um, but I think we have to positively to make sure that doesn't happen okay all right thank you um emma is I think something you just pick up on something you talked about is <laughs> will multi-locational businesses need to be a little bit more open-minded in regard to where their office locations are and be more balanced in their portfolio rather really, than one big office sorry well, it's a really interesting question and in it it's interesting because i think the technology is a real leveler it takes away differentiation of geography so we're all on this call together we could be sat anywhere in any jurisdiction so I think that will open people's eyes to um, how you can work differently we've certainly heard lots of high profile occupiers so you know Barclays talking about they don't see their Clary Wharf building being very densely occupied for some time and I do wonder if it will take us to this hybrid model I talked about where inevitably an organization will have a HQ but then you'll see some regional hubs and home working and I you know in terms of what might drive people out of say London there's some real challenges for London around the tube and obviously at the moment people are being told and, and to try and avoid using public transport if they're returning to the workplace and, and that's more challenging in London and obviously you've seen higher instances of infection rates from COVID-19 too so there's probably a real attractiveness about some of the regions and particularly the the southwest where we've obviously so far um, seen ourselves at the bottom of those tables um, so it's like I do think it's likely to make people think differently but I probably come back to some points John was making around you know what is the purpose of the office and what are we going to see because I I predict what we won't see in any hub is banks of desks because you can work from a desk at home now and that's been proved to be very successful but what you miss are those collaborative tools um, the spaces that provide community um, one of the most missed places in our building is our, our fund fantastic restaurant that's where everyone got together to really talk and eat it was the heart of our building so I think we'll need to put those things back in as soon as it's safe and appropriate to do so and think about those activities that John was articulating you need to do in the office so I, I see some rethinking and redesign a space around activity-based working um, rather than just banks of desk so that's where we might see some innovation and change. I think that amenity piece is interesting because I think that makes it even more important from a retention and a recruitment perspective, doesn't it? As to why are you different than your com uh, competitor next door? You know, what can you offer more within the office space? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Um, Matt, a question that came in uh, for you is in regard to creating these sort of white boxes, is there not a risk that we are creating or promoting sort of 
germophobia, um, you know, an overly sterile environment? As I said, I don't think that uh, you know, we cannot design cost effective, um, safe, pandemic safe offices. We're talking about clean room technology or sort of, you know, um, silicon chip type production facilities to get to that level of cleanliness. So, so we're not. What we're going to do is pragmatic approaches that give people the comfort to get back into buildings, probably provide ventilation systems that we should have anyway, that are better for people to work around. So you have your own fresh air, it's not a mixing system, but we're not, we're not going to be looking at the levels of filtration and air flows and air rates that would mean that we could occupy through, in, through a pandemic. That, that's just not something that's going to happen. It's just a pragmatic approach to make people feel safe and to improve the environment is I see where we're going with this. All right, thank you. Uh, we've got a question in uh, while we've been on from uh, Anna. So I'm not quite sure who is going to answer this one, but we'll, uh, we'll see when we get to the end of it. With greater flexibility of choice of spaces to work, how does this marry with the non-desk sharing stipulation of the government? And how will FMs implement cleaning regimes to match, to provide the comfort required? Who wants to take that one on? Any, uh, uh, do you want me to start or go on then Emma, you kick off because uh, it's something our plan ahead team have been looking at very carefully in terms of any reoccupation strategy and yes the, the sort of media hinted that there was going to be a prohibition on hot desking in the government guidance and actually it, it wasn't as um, precise or, or clear as that in the guidance that's come out so far but you have to assume that's best practice and the guidance talks about not sharing equipment and, and obviously materials within the office so in my mind it firstly drives you back towards the, the concept that agile working is here to stay for some time because inevitably more people will need to work from home both to manage sort of occupancy and density levels in the building and secondly to manage the as you say the necessary working protocols and cleaning regime that comes with it we're certainly talking about um, making sure everyone has an assigned desk so they know where they work and enhance cleaning around that and perhaps looking at rotors for teams so that you have team red in one week team blue the next and you can manage both manage sort of the infection risk in terms of the same people gathering in the office at any one time and then manage cleaning accordingly but i think that it will be incumbent upon fm teams to really be quite prescriptive in some of the working protocols around these things because it's not just desks it's mfds it's pens it's all the things that you go about and, and touch and use in an office so i think there's a task to rethink all of that to make sure that it meets the covid secure requirements John, do you want to pick up on that? Yeah, I think in the short term, it's going to provide a real challenge to, to lots of businesses um, to, to actually implement that where, where there is already agile working in practice. You can't assign a desk to a person, um, to every single person, because there aren't enough desks. And actually, they won't be, you know, the juggling of, of the right people in the right days. And I think we're looking at certainly... Um, the, the fact that you wouldn't um, share a desk during a day, um, it will be your desk for the day. And therefore, actually, each night the cleaners will clean that space. I think, you know, we, we still have telephones in our offices. Um, uh, I think we'll probably want to put them away somewhere and just give everybody their own headset or something so that um, they're not, hand, you know, the number of, as, as Emma said, the number of touch points is, is reduced. I think long term, that's going to be the really interesting bit is to as to how that work I think works I think if we don't you know if, if we're in a pandemic world forever I think we've all got a problem because you know we won't be able to go to restaurants or pubs or public transport is obviously the the real key to everybody getting back to some form of normality um, and if that's so the office will almost be at the back of that because actually yes most of us can continue to work from home okay thank you um, right there's one that's come in here uh, from Scion, I hope I pronounced that right, which is definitely one for Matt. Um, could adding or changing to HEPA filters be a simple solution for improving air quality? Um, no, probably not. Uh, adding HEPA filters is uh, going to increase the sort of fan power without getting too techy about it. It's going to significantly add the sort of the fan power that you need to push air around the building. And, and it's the ductworks only one route for, for air to get into a building as well so every time we open and close doors the air comes in with us so to get to sort of uh, those levels of cleanliness that we could occupy uh, would probably mean that we have to have air locks and things like that you have in you no know, sort of uh, that, that laboratory type, type environment 
and I think the cost of it as well, doing those sorts of things would be prohibitive. So um, I, I can't see that. It would certainly change the carbon agenda um, as well in terms of the additional energy that we would need. So I, I can't see that working. Um, I've had to think about that before, but I don't think that's a practical or pragmatic solution. Okay. And Andy, Andy, I think that's Sean. It's Welsh. Uh, <laughs> apologies to uh, our, Welsh, <laughs> our Welsh watchers. Um, I mean, Matt, just final points, I'm conscious of time. Is, is there a risk that if we go down the di displacement system route, office temperatures will generally rise a little bit? And could that affect productivity going forward? Because we're not pumping in so much air and chilling it so much? Well, I think that um, we may have to look at what the comfort bands anywhere are going forward. Uh, they're probably going to be slightly less comfortable places to occupy anyway over the next few months as we turn things off or down. So we may react anyway, and the, the band of, of what seems to be acceptable might change. As I said, I think that um, the office, the loads that we see in offices, you know, are, go are going down anyway. The lighting loads are going down, the equipment loads, the occupancy levels are going down. So Traditionally, those sorts of systems sometimes struggle to meet the office loads that we have. But in the future, if we have reduced loads, it may be that those types of systems are appropriate because of those things. They will give you that better air quality anyway, and they may be able to, with static cooling devices, provide the sort of comfort that, that might be slightly warmer than we're currently experiencing, but that might be an appropriate reaction and will help with the, with the carbon agenda as well. Okay, that is great. I think we'll begin to draw it to a close there. We're sort of five minutes over time. Uh, we haven't seemed to have lost too many participants during the, the last half an hour. So hopefully we've done a, a half decent job and, and provided some, some thought and insight. Um, from my perspective, thank you enormously to, to Emma, John and Matt for, for your thoughts and, and ideas. Um, from a BCO perspective, um, please feel free to have a look at the website. There's a, on the events page going forward, there are a number of these webinars around the country which you, uh, you should be able to access. The next one is next week on the customer experience revolution. And I also see that there is a, a next gen quiz um, coming forward as well. Everyone seems to love a good quiz at this moment in time. But uh, thank you all for, for dialing in. Uh, please keep an eye out on the website for more of these events, both nationally and regionally. And have a good rest of the Wednesday. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Bye.